For Krima Media's quality, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today to discuss crime in the country is DA Shadow Minister of Police, Andrew Whitfield. So, Mr. Whitfield, uh, the Portfolio Committee on Police uh, received a presentation from the South African Police Service, a way it was informed that only 808 uh, police stations out of 1,155 have totally implemented uh, the National Rural Safety Strategy. Can you tell us why uh, do you think that the SAPS uh, under Police Minister Peggy Keller's watch is dragging its feet when it comes to implementing uh, this strategy? So I think it's important for us to start with the obvious fact, which is that it's very difficult to police rural areas which are geographically very diverse, uh, very large and expansive areas, often with mountains, uh, hills, rivers, uh, difficult roads to traverse. Uh, and so before we even need a rural safety strategy, what we need is properly equipped police stations. I mean, that's just the basics. We need to make sure that police stations in rural areas are given different resources to police stations in urban areas. So, for example, in uh, Biti village outside of Mtata in the Eastern Cape, uh, when I was there last year, the police officers complained that they were given the same uh, vehicles that uh, the stations in Umtata were given, whereas they have to police a very mountainous rural area from village to village. And what they actually needed were Toyota Land Cruisers. Now, that's just one practical example. That doesn't require a strategy. It requires the application of common sense to make sure that our police officers working in difficult conditions have the right tools to do the job. But I think, you know, coming back to your question, you know, they did adopt this uh, revised rural uh, safety strategy in uh, October 2019 and launched it to much fanfare, I think, in Mpumalanga or Limpopo up north. But ultimately, as you say, uh, you know, only 80% of the uh, police stations have actually launched uh, and implemented this this rural safety strategy. Now, what are the implications? Well, in the presentation that we received uh, from the SAPs, it really just appears that it's a paper exercise. It's simply a tick box exercise where you have to comply with certain uh, requirements. But the main the the main requirements that we believe are necessary to tackle rural crime are not being measured. We didn't get any assessment on the performance of that plan in so far as the deliverables, right? And the deliverables are how do you reduce the uh, crimes in rural areas such as stock theft, such as farm murders, uh, mass killings in rural villages that we've seen. Lusikisiki in the Eastern Cape is a very rural, very, very dangerous place where sexual offences are some of the highest in the country. Uh, what are the targeted interventions that this rural safety strategy is actually uh, yielding results on? And, and it wasn't clear from the presentation that the, the strategy is actually delivering uh, results. So it is four years since it was launched. Uh, it should be 100% implemented. And once implemented, it should now be able to present these are the tangible uh, results and the impact of the strategy. But unfortunately, from the presentation we received, uh, it's simply not good enough. We don't have any indication that the strategy is, in effect, uh, working. Mm -hmm. So in the Northern Cape, Mr. Whitfield, more than half of the SAPS police station have not yet implemented the strategy. And in KZN, 23% of the SAPS stations have also not implemented the strategy. What have you identified as the issues uh, in not implementing this strategy? Yeah. And my experience of, of the South African police service where it works is that there's a strong collaboration with community policing structures, whether that's a, a strong CPF or community policing forum, whether it's uh, partnerships with farm watchers, neighborhood watchers, uh, and other rural uh, community safety forums that exist. Uh, you know, the SAPs cannot do this job on their own. And so if they want to succeed, they need to reach out uh, and form partnerships with communities. Now, that is one of the requirements uh, in this um, safety strategy, but it, it's not working. They want to form these community uh, uh, safety uh, forums uh, in order to help the police, 
but there, there, there isn't sufficient collaboration or leadership or understanding of how to make those partnerships work. Uh, I've experienced um, the police stations with very good uh, uh, commanders in charge of those police stations who are able to form partnerships, and then you can see on the basis of the crime statistics how they're able to tackle those crimes. In in uh, Cathcart, which is outside Stutterham, I'm at Lati, again in the Eastern Cape. I'm a bit biased towards the Eastern Cape because I'm I'm coming to you from the Eastern Cape. It's my home. You know, in that area, farmers are desperate. Stock thieves are just hopping fences and helping themselves as though it's some, some sort of a, a, a supermarket where they can come and can collect sheep and cattle and slaughter uh, without any fear of consequences. And I'm going up there to meet with them, to suggest to them that they engage the police to say, how do we form a partnership together? How do we work together? How do we feed intelligence to one another in order to create a safer environment for all of us? It's simply not acceptable for SAPs to sit behind their gates and, and behind the doors and police stations and not work with communities. I think that that is the single greatest secret to success of any safety strategy is the extent to which those responsible for the strategy like SAPs are prepared to collaborate and engage. Mm, it looks like you agree now with the recent report that was issued by the Afri Forum Research Institute, which recently it's recently claimed that uh, there is a decline in the farm killings, but only uh, when it comes to uh, community safety structure involvement. Well, I don't have that report and I've not read it. But what mm. I can tell you is that I, 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 you know, SAPS is under-resourced, it is under-capacitated, mm. it's become increasingly poorly trained. We have less boots on the ground than we've ever had before. Uh, we've got more police officers behind desks and police officers who don't even know how to use their firearms. We've got firearms being stolen from police stations, police officers being attacked and killed. It's simply not possible. Uh, and this is not based on any report. This is just common sense. It's simply not possible for the South African Police Service to uh, implement its mandate on its own. Uh, and, and that was admitted to by the former National Police Commissioner General Ketla Sitole, who in Parliament said, and I was in that meeting, where he said SAPS is failing to fulfill its constitutional mandate. And, and it's for failing to fulfill its constitutional mandate because it, it went through a series of quite significant budget cuts over the last few years. Uh, which resulted in them having to restructure the organization, which has seen about 20,000 personnel over the last four years being retrenched uh, or, or allowed to go on early retirement. So we're losing skills, we're losing experience, uh, and um, I think common sense dictates that partnership policing based on intelligence-driven strategies uh, is going to be uh, the way that we need to turn the tide on violent crime in South Africa. Now, tell us about a campaign that you are going to launch where you'll be assessing the implementation of the SAPS rural safety strategy at rural police stations across the country. So in September 2019, um, and maybe it's a coincidence, but maybe it's not, maybe it's good opposition politics, and maybe I should claim the latter. But in September 2019, the DA actually launched our own rural safety plan, which was a comprehensive and detailed document on how we believe that the use of technology as well as this collaborative model that I've, I've, I've set out with rural policing units in communities working together with SAPS. Uh, we launched this in 2019 in September. A month later, the police launched their rural safety strategy. So, so we'll be taking two things into the uh, campaign. I'll be visiting these police stations and visiting uh, communities, farmers, rural villages. Uh, I started last year. Uh, I, I was in KwaZulu-Natal as well. In, in June, July last year to visit a number of police stations, some in rural areas, some satellite police stations. Again, looking at the basic challenges, uh, the basic challenges that have nothing to do with a strategy. The fact that there's no diesel or petrol for, for generators, that the generators don't work even if they do have the fuel. The fact that the telephone lines are not working and police officers don't have enough ammunition, for example. So, so these are the basic needs. That's the one element. The other element is to assess whether these police stations in rural areas have, in fact, implemented the rural safety strategy and what that has meant for them. Like, what has it really meant? Does it Has it meant that they get additional resources from Pretoria? Uh, does it mean that it's had a, a direct impact um, uh, on uh, safety in these rural areas? I want to hear from the police officers uh, who are the ones that have to implement these policies that are developed in Pretoria 
but sometimes may very well be out of touch with the local conditions uh, and the local issues within in a policing area. So I I look forward to, to to visiting as many police stations as possible, but also talking, as I said, to communities to assess what kind of collaboration they are experiencing with SAPs and, and whether that is in fact yielding res the results that I think it is. So that campaign is underway. It's ongoing. Uh, and what we'll be doing as well is presenting our rural safety strategy that we launched in September 2019 to these structures, making it available to whoever wants to see it, and then getting information and advice from these communities on how we can improve our own document so that we can relaunch that uh, and, and again send it to the National Police Commissioner as we did in 2019. Uh, because I think there's some good ideas in there, uh, and specifically the deployment of technology such as drones, whereas we know that the South African Police Service does not have a single drone or drone pilot uh, in their ranks. So, you know, there's some 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 really uh, quick available wins that I think can turn the situation around if, um, if the minister is open to ideas from the opposition. Mm, and talking about uh, service delivery in the sector, last year your party discovered that only 44% of the 270 uh, SAPS police stations around the country under their phones. Uh, it's all via the 10 triple one number, which we all use uh, for different reasons when we conduct at uh, the police station. What was the explanation from uh, Minister Teller's office? And have you followed up on this uh, to see if something has been done to improve the savings? Yeah, the, the, the research that we did was not uh, through the 10111 line. We, we actually did uh, two things. The one was that we actually phoned police stations directly and we engaged, we tried to engage by, by seeing if they would answer their phones and how long uh, it would take. And we developed some research in, in, in respect of that. The second thing we did was we submitted a set of parliamentary questions uh, to assess how the 10111 center uh, calls were being handled. Um, mm. That data that we received was incomplete. Uh, we, we didn't receive data from every province because the systems are so archaic and out of date that they aren't even able to keep a log of the number of calls that they make. So, you know, we we found that there had been 7 million drop calls over the last three years. Um, and as I said in the, in the debate on the State of the Nation address, and I said to the president, behind every single one of those phone calls is a potential victim uh, of, of a crime. Uh, and, you know, if we can't even get the basics right of answering a phone call and deploying the police to respond to a crime scene uh, or, or to go and to prevent a crime from taking place, we've got no hope in turning the situation around. The president, I was very pleased to hear uh, in response to the big noise that we made around um, this issue, has um, ag agreed to look into partnering with the private sector, which is which is it was welcomed. Uh, but I did tell him I would eat the words off the page of my speech if he's able to get even close to running a satisfactory operation by the time of his next SONA because we have a an incapable state that is making commitments that it's simply not capable of executing. Uh, but, you know, we hold out hope and we hope that the president is able to provide leadership at least on this one key issue. Mm, and Mr. Whitfield, you also criticize government for what you say is a complete failure of the management uh, when it comes to uh, strengthening crime intelligence and improving visible policy. Do you have suggestions on how this could be addressed? Well, one of the biggest issues with uh, crime intelligence is that it has been captured and politically uh, contaminated by the African National Congress. We've seen how uh, it, you know, from Jackie Salebi uh, all the way through uh, to to today, there have been a number of individuals who have had a very particular political interest in crime intelligence, uh, and we've seen a tremendous amount of corruption within that division of the South African Police Service, which has led to a lot of hardworking, good police officers looking to work elsewhere because they simply cannot continue to operate uh, in that uh, environment. But the key collapse of crime intelligence is the networks on the ground. Crime intelligence requires information from communities. It requires informants. It requires people that are connected to these criminal syndicates that we need to dismantle. Um, and, and that information doesn't seem to be coming through to SAPS. In fact, when I spoke to a station commander recently in KwaZulu-Natal just two weeks ago, he said that the quality of crime intelligence they get is for example, um, Member of Parliament Andrew Whitfield is coming to your area in Marion Hill uh, 
Well, this information is publicly available. I mean, we we advertise this fact, but yet this is the quality of intelligence that, that the police stations are receiving. And so the entire crime intelligence ecosystem uh, and value chain is completely compromised. It has been for a very long time. It doesn't have the right kind of leadership. Uh, and I believe it has been abused uh, for, for internal political reasons within SAPS, uh, as well as potentially even uh, political reasons outside of SAPS. And we, we, we know about the spy grabber that was uh, they tried to procure prior to the NASREC conference, uh, which was the ANC conference a few years ago. Um, and and, and it's, it all harks back to this issue of state capture and the interference of a political party in the operations of the state. This, uh, a political party should never, ever, ever have the kind of access uh, to uh, institutions of the state, such as crime intelligence, like the ANC have had uh, over over many years. And lastly, the DA has been consistent in its call for President Cyril Ramaphosa to replace Minister Tsele, as well as to devolve policy and powers uh, to capable provincial and local governments uh, to get the job done. Tell us about that. Well, I think there's sufficient evidence uh, to justify the call to replace Minister Tele. Minister Tele was appointed in 2018. He has been the minister for five years. Violent crime has continued to to increase. And in fact, the, the president is now effectively halfway through his term of office. If we can, uh, if he's got two terms, uh, that would give him 10 years, right? So he's halfway through and he promised in his first Sunday that he would halve violent crime by the end of his term. Well, he's halfway through and violent crime is up. Murder is up by 40%. We're seeing an increase in sexual offences, a lack of consequence management in our criminal justice system, thanks to the DNA backlog and, and other issues which which have really compromised our criminal justice system in so far as curtailing violent crime. So I, I do believe there's sufficient evidence, uh, as well as public interest, uh, to replace the Minister of Police with somebody who's fit for purpose, competent and qualified, and who is prepared to do the work that's required to change the policy and policing environment within the SAPs, as well as to restore some sense of professionalism and discipline management within the police. The police is never going to be able to be turned around until there is proper consequence management for the corrupt and incompetent individuals who are compromising uh, the safety of our communities by not doing their jobs properly, and sometimes, in fact, willfully and intentionally compromising the safety of our citizens. And then, yes, so that's Minister Tele, absolutely. And then we we are calling for the devolution of policing powers because, as I said to you earlier, you know, the people in Pretoria don't often know what is needed uh, within lo the local context on the ground. And often station commanders are very frustrated because they can't even procure a pencil without having to write to the provincial office. And then the provincial office has to go to the national office. They can't do anything, replace a tire on a vehicle or procure a diesel for a generator. The red tape involved in this centralized policing model is debilitating. It's causing huge frustration. It's hindering the ability of good, uh, hardworking local police officers from doing their work. Uh, and so that's one element of why devolution is important. And then another important principle is it increases accountability. At the end of the day, uh, the station commander must be accountable to the community that they serve uh, and the CPF. Um, but what we're seeing now is station commanders, well, it's out of my control. You know, I don't have the power. It's in Pretoria or it's in uh, the provincial office. Uh, and so we don't see the kind of accountability that I think would help to improve policing. Uh, and I think that if we were able to devolve it, that's the that that would certainly improve. And, and the very last thing on, on devolution is where you do have capable local governments who have strong law enforcement capability, who have well-managed budgets, who can deploy uh, their finances to bolster community safety through technology, cameras, drones, uh, and other uh, interventions, such as the city of Cape Town, uh, then we need to find ways, uh, if our interest is in improving safety, uh, surely we need to set aside the politics and work with what works. And, and what is happening in the city of Cape Town and the Western Cape government with the law enforcement advance, advancement program, or, or they call it LEAP, um, it's working very well. Uh, I was in Guguletu recently where the station commander there uh, uh, told me how incredible the support from the city and the Western Cape government has been and that they're partnering and working together 
to bring murder down by almost 40% uh, in the last year. So there are results that are proven to work through these partnerships, and devolution will be a key uh, component of uh, uh, the future of policing in South Africa, I believe. There was DA Shadow Minister of Police, Andrew Whitfield, in conversation with policy discussing crime in the country.